Our critic tonight is Richard Schickel, who I think is the Dean of American Film Critics and Reviewers. His tenure dates back to the mid-1960s at Life Magazine, and then in the early 70s when Life no longer was a weekly, he switched over to Time Magazine. He is equally known for a number of scrupulously researched but very lively books on both classic and contemporary cinema, as diverse as D.W. Griffith and Walt Disney, and a forthcoming volume which he's given us a peek at on the actor Marlon Brando. He's also one of the few critics who I can think of is of physical stature to be with our main guest tonight, the actor turned director Clint Eastwood. Next year, Mr. Eastwood will celebrate his 20th anniversary as a filmmaker. He has completed 15 films to date. We had the great honor of having, I think, the, the second American screening of his 15th film, White Hunter, Black Heart. He is here tonight to talk about his work as a director, to give us insights into the progression of the films, to give us a sense of the difficulties and challenges of working in those dual roles, and to give us a little bit of the pleasure that he puts into his filmmaking. It gives me an extraordinary amount of pleasure to welcome here a return engagement for one, first time for the other, Richard Schickel and Clint Eastwood. That's the biggest welcome I've ever had. <laughs> I thought I'd start out by reading something that recently came to my attention. Um, quotation. I suppose Clint Eastwood is the most underrated director in the world today. They don't take him seriously the way they don't take beautiful girls seriously. They can't believe they're intelligent if they're beautiful. They can't believe they can act if they're beautiful. They must be a little ugly to be forgiven by men. And an actor like Eastwood is such a pure type of mythic hero star in the Wayne tradition that nobody's going to take him seriously as a director, but somebody ought to. Uh, that was said by Orson Welles. Um, and uh, I second the motion. And I think we're here principally because Clint is a very fine director and a director who has had, in my view, an extraordinarily coherent career. Uh, a career that you know shows what all us critics like to see in a career, which is development. Um, <laughs> uh, I think also that actors like Clint, to sort of make a little variant on on what Wells said about him, um, I think. Indeed, everybody who begins in the arts in very popular forms and then moves on to doing more serious work has difficulty with the critical establishment, the academic establishment, and so on, in getting themselves to be taken seriously by those people. Uh, I think there's a natural sort of literary bias amongst people who write about films. Uh, against, oddly enough, against the medium itself, but most especially against people who come up out of the medium, um, out of sort of, if you will, humble backgrounds in the medium. Uh, I think that it's important that all of us understand that you know, the great American vernacular film tradition is a very long one. It is our central film tradition. 
Uh, I think uh, Clint has worked within that tradition and gently and steadily pushed outwards against the boundaries of genre filmmaking, if you will. Until now, in his most recent films as a director, it seems to me that he has um, you know, quite transcended those bonds and uh, is working in a different territory, which we will come to uh, a little bit later. Uh, I suppose the simple first question anybody should ask anybody who does this difficult thing, uh, which is to direct movies, um, is to ask them what motivated them in the first instance to do it, how long they wanted to do it. Um, so I'll begin with that. Start with the tough ones, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, uh, I think I've wanted to direct for almost as long as I've been in the motion picture business. Uh, as a contract player years ago in the early 50s uh, at Universal, I uh, used to go down to the sets to try to watch the other actors in the sets and try to see if I could learn something from them. I found myself becoming more and more fascinated with the directors and what they were doing because they were obviously managing the, the total ensemble. And um, that, that uh, I think later on in my career, that kind of took over. There's two ways an actor can approach his career. One is you can stay in the trailer. I think I'm quoting somebody here. You can stay <laughs> in the trailer and, uh, and uh, call your agent and uh, call your bookie or what have you and, and, and go out and do your lines when called upon. Or you can be uh, involved with the total... Uh, construction of the motion picture. The director is obviously the most uh, involved in the total construction of a motion picture. I love motion pictures. I love them. I love viewing them and I love uh, uh, making them. And so that's, uh, that's how I became involved with it. I, and I, in uh, 1960, when I was doing Rawhide, 61, I had talked to the, uh, I had talked about directing an episode of that. And that got shot down for various reasons due to uh, uh, CBS policy on another show. And uh, so I had, to, I had to put the directing idea on hold. And then in 1970, um, I uh, had an opportunity to direct a script written by a friend of mine. And, um, and it was a small, a humble project of which didn't cost a lot of money. And I agreed to act in it as well as direct it in order to get it done. And that, um, that's sort of where it all started. At some point, I recall you saying, and you may want to disguise the exact circumstances, but uh, it seems to me you did once say to me that on one of the big pictures you were working on as an actor, that you became kind of appalled by the, the waste of it and the, the, the foolishness of it. The, uh, could, could you expand a little on that? Yeah, that... That, uh, that's the truth. I had um, I'd just done, in the late 60s, I'd done three pictures in a row that, had, uh, not in a row, but three pictures that had taken six months to make. Now, six months is a long time to be on a film. It is for me, anyway. And uh, a couple of those films were demanded a certain length in the schedule, and others, others didn't. And uh, one of them, I, I think I don't mind mentioning, it was Paint Your Wagon. But it was a film that was... Uh, just took a lot of time. For some reason, there was the management never got itself together when it, when they started to attack the project, and uh, therefore the project took probably twice as long, in my opinion, as it should have. And so after a while, I thought, you know, I'm I might be making mistakes in my career, but if I want to make mistakes, if I'm going to make mistakes in my career, I want to make them. I don't want somebody else making them for me. So I thought, why don't I just try it anyway? And that was shortly after that. I did several other films, but. Uh, it was after that in 1969 that I started anticipating the idea of maybe directing and doing Play Misty for me with the encouragement of a close friend of mine, Don Siegel. I think uh, just the other day you told, I thought, a wonderful story about Don visiting you on, on the set of, of, uh, of Paint Your Wagon. Oh. <laughs> which I thought yeah. maybe sums up this, this aspect of it. Well, Don had come up to see me about another project we were doing called Two Mules for Sister Sarah. And anyway, we were uh, working, and he, I took him out and showed him the set of Paint Your Wagon, which is back in the, in the woods, uh, deep in the woods of uh, eastern Oregon. And, uh, and there was this town there that cost about $5 million at that time, a very expensive city that had been built for the picture, western-type town. 
And we both were going through it, and I was showing him this and that. And he says, oh, this is something. He says, don't you, couldn't we rig up a script and come in here? In three weeks, we could be in here and out of here and shoot this whole thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> As I'm sure the production at that time would have not appreciated it, but uh, well, they might not have noticed it, of course. <laughs> have, yeah, because they certainly weren't around to getting to it. <laughs> but Don, uh, you know, it just it was salivating because here's a man who had worked all his life on very austere budgets and had never had the luxury of this kind of a production, and here he was seeing this this beautiful Western town that at five million dollars in 1968 was a lot of money uh, to spend on a set. And he was uh, just salivating like a wild dog. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't uh, this is a point that I think sometimes cineasts kind of miss? But uh, it seems to me a point uh, a point of honor with you uh, as a director, and that is uh, to shoot efficiently, to shoot uh, as quickly as possible, and and with the least expenditure of money required. You know, to make the necessary, uh, to do the necessary work. It strikes me as more than just, um, you know, simple frugality. That there's something um, that goes to the whole tradition I was talking about before of uh, most of the directors we're talking about, the Hawkses and Walshes and Bill Wellmans and so forth. Also, took a, was a point of pride in them that they were not excessive as as directors or wasteful. Yeah, I feel that uh, excessive, uh, it seems to me the word director means to, is sort of to direct and manage, and that means that you have to have a vision in mind, and that means you have to have a program in your mind. And you can't just uh, bring uh, 100 people or 30 people or whatever size crew you have out and just sort of start guessing. You have to have a, a, a program, a plan of attack. And if you follow through that, you have a certain amount of respect for the people who have said, sure, I'll put up the money to back you. And that, that, is, uh, that to me is very important. I, I like that trust. I want that to continue. I want, uh, so maybe I'm doing it for selfish reasons, but I like, I'd like that co to continue my whole career is for people to say, sure, you want to do this project? By all means, we're going to come right in. I suppose if you do quite a few projects where you get wasteful and, uh, and you start going over budget, people will start thinking, well, he doesn't have a plan in mind or he's starting to waffle around. Um, I, I grew up watching the films of the of the, uh, of the ones you were talking about, uh, the, the Walters and the Hawks and Fords, and these people were famous. Uh, the famous case, I guess, is uh, is uh, Grapes of Wrath. I think it was shot in 37 days or something like that. And and it's a wonderful film today. It's viewed and revered in cinema classes today, as it uh, as it has been over the years. And there's a lot of films that are shot nowadays in, uh, in six months and cost $65 million that I don't think a year from now anyone's going to really care about. But the main thing is the heart and the essence and the management and the word director was adhered to in its proper, uh, its proper interpretation. Is there, um, what's the trick to that? Is there, is it, aside from being careful and sensible and all of that, um, is it that, uh, an enormous amount of pre-planning? Is it uh, the scouting of the locations? I mean, what, what's, what, if you were giving advice, there must be somebody in the room who wants to direct. Uh, I mean, it, almost if you get 10 Americans together in the United States, one of them does want to direct. <laughs> so um, what's, what's, the, uh, what's the advice to give to somebody with that ambition? All of those things you, you mentioned are very important. But I think the, the most important thing is to develop and keep the habit of decision making. Unfortunately, you can't uh, waver. It's not like uh, an interior decorator standing there and looking at a set and uh, going around and moving this to here, and then they'll move it back. You, eventually, you have to decide, OK, this belongs here. If it doesn't belong there, then OK, move it back, but don't bother me anymore. We've got the big picture to handle. I've got the, big, the overall thing. And it's uh, and I've I've worked with people who just get tremendously obsessed with the lint, and they forget the <laughs> they forget the portrait, you know, and, and uh, the, the you have to get the portrait before the dust falls on it. So uh, it's just a question of prioritizing yourself, and I think that's what the secret is. It's just the priorities. And not that doesn't mean to slough the movie. That doesn't mean if an actor doesn't do the scene correctly that you should just print and move on. It's uh, 
every scene demands a certain amount of attention. And when you get it completed to your satisfaction, that's fine. Your satisfaction has to be somewhat set in your mind, though. When you see something, you've got to be able to say, that's it. I like that. Somebody says, I, oh, gee, I can do it better. Yeah, but I like that. And mm -hmm. sometimes in an actor's case, you'll say, okay, we'll try it again. Uh, and nine times out of ten, it was good the way you liked it, uh, better the way you liked the first time. But as a courtesy, you might go for an extra one. But by and large, you're ready to move on. And you get a rhythm going, and the actors get hung up in the rhythm, and the crew gets hung up in the rhythm. And they all say, yeah, well, now we're going to move from here to there. And, and so we feel like we're going someplace. But if you get a set that is very ponderous, and you don't feel like you're going any place. The crew doesn't feel like they're really accomplishing anything other than putting in a day's eight hours and uh, and getting their check. And uh, the actors are are figuring that uh, forget where they were, forget where they started. They forget the energy level that they had weeks ago. And you can maintain the early uh, uh, films that, that uh, and film directors you were talking about maintained a terrific pace because the performers were all involved and they got in and they all everybody ran for the goal line. I wondered this. Uh, <clears throat> I've been writing a book about an actor who made one attempt at directing. It, it was a rather interesting film. It's called One-Eyed Jacks. And uh, the fact is, as I, as I looked at the material about that, it occurred to me that very often the actor's temperament is not a director's temperament. That is to say, actors really do like to try things a lot of different ways. Actors are often ambivalent about themselves in the role. That is to say, they say, well, you know, maybe I want to do a little more this way or a little more that way. And I think there is a kind of, this is not a bad thing about actors necessarily, but it seems to me antithetical as a rule to the directorial temperament, the kind of one of experiment with different colors and, as they do a scene and all that stuff. I mean, I think an act, many actors will go on rehearsing Forever, if you let. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you are an actor, and you began as an actor. I mean, there is, ob or am I all wet on this notion? No, I don't. I think you're right on to something because there are a lot of actors who do that. They'd like to go on, and they would go on forever. But it is up to the director to make that actor feel comfortable. He or she feel uh, extremely uh, confident about what they've just done. And if they want to try another, you indulge them, and you and you say, maybe you want to try it with this, or you give them a suggestion of how to try it. It may not be the one you use in the cutting, but it's the one that you, you go ahead and try. And I think that's fine. Being an actor makes me extremely sympathetic to that. However, a director has to finally be able to say, no, that's enough. Enough already. We're, we've, we've got it. This is really working well. And you have to make that actor walk away from that scene with every bit of confidence as you have that you've got it. Even if you don't have confidence that you've got it, you've got to make him <laughs> think you do. <laughs> Well, actually, you're just saying something. George Cukor, who was a director who couldn't be more antithetical to you mm -hmm. in the kind of films he did, he said once said to me, the only job a director has to do is he has to stay on his feet and keep everybody else on their feet and move him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a pl platoon leader or something. You're, you've got a, a squad of, a uh, platoon of uh, people behind you, and you're, uh, you're rushing up the hill. And you have to keep everybody encouraged to do that. Otherwise, everybody will drop their rifles and head for the back door. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we have a, a number of clips to play. And uh, Bruce and I, as we kind of planned the, uh, the clips, we thought we might start with um, an iconographic scene, if you will. Uh, uh, it's a scene. Uh, Obviously, you direct it. And uh, what, my, what's, what's Orson's my... phrase here? <laughs> Mythic heroic scene. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I was going to get my dictionary out of my little Webster's pocket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, this is the one scene, I suspect, in the scenes that we're about to show this evening that actually needs no introduction. <laughs> There's one bit of trivia. When he was reading the newspaper as she's pouring the sugar, you notice he was reading the want ads. I, maybe he was looking for a job. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's, it's possible to abstract the kind of content of that scene from the 
manner of the scene. But as I looked at it today, out of context, not seeing it in the run of the movie, uh, one of the things I was struck by is it's a wonderfully directed scene. Uh, and the first thing I flash back on is the other, to me, great kind of mythic, if you will, icon scene is the one for Don in, uh, in Dirty Harry uh, with uh, you know, the initial gunfight. And I think this... Uh, uh, I think this picture has references to that, and I think it, it, it is, you might almost say, an homage to, to Don Siegel and that kind of work. Is that, is that some thought of it, or is it just the way professionally one makes this scene? Uh, I, I don't know. On a conscious level, I don't know. I would say uh, a lot of influence, uh, I've had a lot of influence with, by Don Siegel because we were close friends, and we started out and did quite a few films together. But I, I'd say maybe subconsciously, I, I tried, I tried to keep the energy that Don Siegel might have had in the scene. How can you? Is there a way of describing how that is that in the cutting? Uh, is, well, is I think, that, that for instance, uh, instead of uh, showing the guy walk to the back door, you have the surprise of him coming back in. There he is. Uh, that's always a kind of a dramatic moment. Then when you go when the when the action starts, uh, everything starts moving, and he starts moving, and the shots are moving, and everybody is going. And then after the action is a burst. Don Siegel, unlike Sam Peckinpah and others who like to ballet uh, a violent act and, and play it in slow motion, always felt that it's violence, uh, and I, I agree with this theory, it should get over with very quick. It's the, uh, the traditional Western gunfight. It isn't necessarily the shooting of the bad guy that is the... Uh, that is the, the thrill of the moment. It's all that prologue up, up to it, all the walk up to it, the, the shots and the guns and the looks and the things. And this, uh, this happens here. It's before and then afterwards. Then, of course, afterwards, I set up the uh, shot to, to give the punchline that I thought would uh, be the punchline of the picture, but I didn't realize it would ricochet around the world quite like it did. <laughs> <laughs> There are a couple of, uh, one of the things that I think pushes the scene wonderfully, there are a couple of just wonderful moves in, both on you and on the other guy. Those are kind of just nice, short, sharp moves of the camera to it, which I think is, is some kind of emphasis that one might not always get in a, sh in a scene like that. I mean, I, I, there would be a temptation to just do a static on, on those. That, that's whimsical. I, I don't know if... Uh... I mean, you could do it static and probably do it very effectively, but it seemed like it seemed like you're gonna if you're gonna hi highlight a, a, a line like that and you're gonna highlight it and you're gonna reprise it later on in the film, that you might as well get the understanding between the but two guys. But there are a couple of moves even before that that starts that that sense of that rhythm into the that leads to that shot actually. Yeah. Um, oh well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, how long did it take to, to do that scene? How many days or? Uh, that scene took uh, about, um, it was a one day uh, sequence. I think it took, uh, we started in the morning, I think we were finished fairly early in the afternoon. So an awful lot of shots and an awful lot of protection yeah. coverage for your editor in that. There's a lot of shots in it, but it, um, it goes fast. Action scenes I find go much faster than other kinds because once you get that first shot, the, the original setups are kind of slow and everybody's kind of moving along. But once you start, you send a guy through the window or something, then everybody kind of gets with the program. They say, like, oh, <laughs> we're going <laughs> to, this is the way we're going to do it then, huh? So then everybody's finding, well, well I'll, instead of going across this table, how about I fly over to these two tables? And every, uh -huh. Everyone kind of gets with it. And the moment you fire a shot off, too, everybody stands at attention. The, hair, the adrenaline gets going. So... Uh, that, uh, that, 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 I think, makes an action sequence move rather rapidly. What about, uh, since we're on this subject, and we won't be on this subject for the rest of the evening, um, and this is a Dirty Harry, and Dirty Harry goes back a long time in your career, and actually a long time in all of our careers. Um, what's the genesis of Dirty Harry? And... Um, 
he was, at least at one time in our lives, a controversial figure to people. Um, how do you feel about Dirty Harry? And, and what did you think as this project came to you? Uh, did you imagine him as a controversial figure? Uh, when it was first uh, suggested, someone suggested I read this property, it was, uh, had been submitted to another actor, and the other actor was telling this person how good he thought the script was, but he didn't want to play it for political reasons. And I, I thought, when I read it, I thought, well, I don't care about political reasons. I, I see it as a, an exciting movie, and um, that's, uh, that's, all, that's all the only way I want to approach it. Uh, I also felt that <clears throat> you can get wrapped up, and in those days it was the end of the 60s and early 70s, and people were looking for political connotation to, to do or not do things. But to me, the idea of you take a crime, uh, like you do in any story, you take... Uh, you take the, the basic crime and you, and you put a time limit on it. And you're going to tell this detective he's going to have to solve this problem in a matter of uh, so many hours. It's, you're going to have, you're going to put a, an obstacle before him right away that's almost impossible. Then you place bef behind that, you place the bureaucratic system of which almost, almost all of us uh, have to deal with in our lives in modern day civilization. And, and we're all sick of it uh, in our lives. Um, and, uh, then you, uh, then you have that obstacle to go over. And, and that right away just puts the, the frustration, and so the d detective gets creative in trying to have to solve the case and trying to skirt the political uh, system and maybe the uh, niceties or the legal uh, aspect. And he felt, that, and he even states in the picture, uh, if a guy can get off uh, on some technicality, then he feels the law is wrong. Well, that's not putting himself above the law. That's just out of frustration at that particular moment. The law is wrong. He, he was sympathizing with the victim at, at, to a tremendous degree. And I think that that appealed in 1971 uh, to audiences who had not seen many pictures of which there was sympathy for the victim or, or concern at all for the victim. And I think the romance of the film is that... The, uh, if anyone was in, a, in trouble in a situation, a violent situation, a potential violent situation, they would want this kind of a guy expending this kind of effort on their behalf. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, having, having paid our debt to myth, um, we're going now more or less in a chronological sampling of, of, of your films. And uh, we're going to do, of course, the, the first film that uh, uh, is your first director's film. Um, one of the things that interests me uh, in going back to this film now after so many years and after so much has, has happened in your career and all the rest of it, um, well... Let's show the clip. This is uh, first, and then let's go into this part of the discussion. Uh, this is uh, a clip from uh, Play Misty for Me, uh, better known now as Fatal Attraction, uh, or Fatal Attraction 1. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a marvelous scene. It's an ex uh, if uh, those of you who don't know play, uh, that uh, film, it's a really rather simple story, a, a, a disc jockey and a small California community um, uh, is uh, really, in effect, stalked. At first, it would seem for merely idle romantic pleasure and then much less idle romantic pleasure uh, by one of his fans who was played and played wonderfully by, uh, by Jessica Waller in, in this film. And this, uh, this is a point at which uh, the, if you could call him that, the, the, well, the protagonist of the film has come to realize that her... her attentions and intentions are, are not at all uh, what his had been and uh, is now up against the fact that this uh, the dawning realization that this uh, may not just be uh, not uh, a lifetime's companion but uh, something uh, more even more dangerous to him than that. And this is a scene of trying to <laughs> uh, trying to uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, an entangling uh, alliance here, or, or a commitment, perhaps. <laughs> Any comments? <laughs> <laughs> 
typical choice of woman for me. <laughs> the home type. <laughs> yeah, it. Uh, I love the line. I told you, it's not what you said, but uh, what what just was unspoken between us. That's always. I uh, when I was 19 years old. I had an experience, not like this, of course, where there's homicide involved, but I had an experience. I think everyone in this room, male or female, has had a similar experience to this. It has no, no uh, gender factor. It's a, it's a question of somebody misinterpreting a commitment a little bit. You, have a, you meet somebody, in this case, he meets her in a bar, and he thinks it's a nice evening, and he's, he's estranged from his girlfriend. Uh, um, I could have made it more complicated. The later version in Fatal Attraction, they made it more complicated, uh, having a wife and a child, of course, which makes him much more of a villain. But to me, this, this was a stronger because the girl was so powerful and she was such a, in her, in her obsessive uh, behavior that it, dis, despite the size of the guy, this, this, the, the larger uh, stature and everything, there's no way to deal with this. It's a very frustrating situation, probably the most frustrating. And, it was very difficult to get this picture made because of that. Everyone kept saying, well, what do you mean? The girl's the best part in the picture. And she's also, uh, she's pushing you around. I said, yeah, but that happens. That's life. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, one of the things about it that's interesting to me when you see the picture in particular, and so this is Jess, Jesse's the scene, not more than yours, I think. Uh, but when you see this, the scene in Toto, you do, as an actor, uh, a wonderful performance of male, if you will, male self-absorption. I mean, he really isn't picking up this lady's signals. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, uh, uh, if she's a comment on a certain kind of uh, possessive kind of female, he's a comment on a certain kind of male who does, to use the cliche, uh, lack the ability to make commitments, uh, is very... Uh, as we see him throughout the film, is really drawn in on himself and on his own issues, his own problems. He's really not paying that much attention to it. Uh, were you aware of, of, of that male side that you were playing? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's, uh, it's not that he's, he's right. It's his weakness that has caused a lot of this. I mean, she's obviously an obsessed fan, but he, there are scenes prior to this that uh, maybe some of the some of you remember where he comes to um, his ho to his house and she's there waiting out front and he he gets upset about it but he doesn't really do anything about it she looks good and it's like okay well what the heck she's here and she's going to fix dinner and it's going to be a great evening and so he he kind of vacillates you know, he kind of goes off and uh, and says well why not well this uh, it, in other words, he didn't spot the signals as you're suggesting right away and he and he kind of went along with it. That's happened uh, to the most intelligent people in the world, much less this guy who probably wasn't the most intelligent. <laughs> and uh, but it's uh, it's it makes for a fascinating thing. He that he, is, he is sort of he's sort of weakened. This moment in the picture that we've just seen is the moment where he's finally decided I've got to stop this now, or else it's going to it's going to be too late. And then what he finds out is it is too late. Did you ever sense that people say to you? Gosh, Clint, you can't play this kind of guy. I mean, you're a take charge guy. You probably shouldn't be playing a, a character like this who, who doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, one of the essences of obviously movie heroism is he always, unlike the rest of us in life, seems to know what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I did have some conflict. Uh, the, the studio didn't like that particular aspect of it. They felt uh, one comment was who the hell wants to see Clint Eastwood play a disc jockey? <laughs> so, so, I, mean, I don't know who, what the hell he wants to see him play disc jockey, but that's just what he does, and that's uh, in order. To, and disc jockeys are sometimes a, a small town like that, or a big fish in a small pond, and they have fans out there just like actors in the films and stage and everything else. And uh, and they, uh, but but it uh, it was a little obstacle. But I figure you've got to start branching, and this is the way. I, I've been playing plenty of the other, and I had Dirty Harry. Or something coming up that was like that, and where, where the wonderful part of it was, uh, as a director, is having the the best role, most dynamic roles being portrayed by other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that part of what you said? Oh well, this would be if, if I'm going to begin as a director. I'm I am an, as an actor. I don't have to carry the biggest scenes all the time. Is that was that make it comfortable for you to? 
That that I guess made it comfortable. However, you you are playing. It's 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 a hard part as an actor because you have to play that. You have to play that. That weakness aspect of it, but it was inherent in script anyway, so it made it fairly easy. That leads to a very simple question that I think will occur to all of us as we go on through the rest of the clips, which is how how do you, as a director, judge your performance as an actor? I mean, in other words, you can't stand back and see yourself. Uh, what methods have you evolved for saying? Okay, that's okay, or more or less, or whatever. How, how do you deal with that? Well, on that particular film, I used a video replay system. <clears throat> so I would look at the shots afterwards on video, and the video camera would go right through the through the the eye of the uh, Panavision camera. However, uh, in later years, I've just kind of dropped that, and I think you just get a habit of it. Uh, uh, many times I'd work with directors who didn't direct much in, in, in the rawhide years. They'd just come in and they'd set up the shots. They were paid uh, uh, to come in and not tamper too much because we were regular characters that ran throughout the show. Mm-hmm. So pretty much you had to guideline your own performances. And uh, you get used to that. And as a director, you get used to it. And, and, and you hopefully you've got a camera operator and you read the people too that are on the set. You read the camera operator. You look at his face. You look at the expression. You can tell if they're happy with the shot or if they're just kind of yeah <laughs> if they're all asleep and they're going oh yes but uh, you have to just kind of you have to be aware of everything around you but eventually you gain it I think mostly through habit mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we're going to move on to a uh, uh, picture that I have uh, the most enormous regard for and um uh, uh, it is in the last couple of decades one of the very few, if not the only, uh, Western films that uh, uh, genuinely qualifies as a kind of as an epic. It's certainly a saga. It's a story that covers vast, uh, vast period of time, vast territory. Um, has a wonderful spaciousness to it. I think I find it interesting to. Uh, counterpose it with a picture as intimate as as uh, as play Misty for me. That shortly thereafter, uh, the director is doing something that really very few directors in our time have been doing. This kind of a, uh, of an of a epic film. Um, the Outlaw Josie Wales is. Uh, uh, a tale of a, a kind of a tale of vengeance and regeneration, uh, if you will, um, and uh, the scene we're going to see is a scene in which uh, is about halfway through the picture. Uh, Josie Wales is a is a man whose family has been wiped out by um, uh, so Civil War raiders, uh, border raiders, uh, and uh, is now uh, escaped. Uh, it's after the war. There's a price still on his head for his wartime activities. People are pursuing him. Um, and this kind of interesting band of people, uh, also outlaws, uh, not outlaws, but loners, persons kind of cast out by the rest of the society, it's sort of one by one been gathered to the side of this figure. Uh, and at this point, uh, he's about to add some more people to to his little company. Um, but first uh, needs to rescue them from Comancheros, uh, who are an outlaw band who have uh, abducted uh, um, three people, who uh, two of whom, one of whom is his friend, and two of whom are about to be his friends, and one of them is about to be a bit more than that. Uh, anyway, this is uh, a scene from uh, out the outlaw Josie Wales. He shows no mercy, this man. <laughs> The, uh, you might have recognized the uh, second man on the right as uh, Richard Farnsworth, who later did a f- starred in films called The Gray Fox, etc. I used to blast him off horses, and then he became a protagonist himself. <laughs> <laughs> How, uh, to me, this movie is a film that seems to be clearly influenced by The Searchers, was it? Uh, not consciously, no. I just, uh, I, I think it just took on a life of its own. I don't think I've ever started any film with another film in mind. Um, 
I, I've, it's, and who knows what it's, what it is a, a compilation of your whole lifetime of viewing mm-hmm. films if, if you're not influenced by something along the way. But I, I don't think so. I loved this book when I first read it. I bought it and, uh, and, and kept it and developed it. It was, um, it was a first novel by a, an Indian and, um, it was a it was a great novel, very small small story, but concise. And the, and the Indians were treated differently than most stories I've ever read, so that appealed to me. Uh, they were uh, uh, treated as uh, intelligent and also as um, as humorous with a sense of humor. And uh, so uh, it it became a very appealing project. But I also liked the saga of it. And and in most of the pictures I had played the Western films. I'd always played the guy who appeared there. I appeared out of nowhere, and there, there he was, and, and you kind of got his background or a taste of his background along the way, but not, not really fully developed. And this particular picture was the first one I'd done a total chronology where you see him at the very beginning when he has a tragic um, demise of his family, and, and then all the way th- you see him through a montage and fighting through the Civil War and then his, his uh, being on the, re- the run after the Civil War. And it, uh, it was a very appealing story for that reason. And of course, he's being a bitter man. He, the less commune, uh, that the less uh, communications with people, uh, the, the better for him. And it seemed the more he tried to get away from, uh, from helping anyone or being involved, the more he, he was forced to get involved. And so, uh. Well, isn't that, isn't that, to me, that's one of the wonderful movements of the story is this guy is just trying to be on the run and these, one after another, these sort of odd people attach yeah. themselves, and they're inappropriate to him, to his life as he yeah. imagines it's going to be, and so forth. And I think that's mm-hmm. a very appealing element in it. Uh, in that, and it's why I say to me, when I said influenced by the Searchers, I didn't. It, it's almost the opposite of the Searchers. In mm-hmm. the, the, the Searchers, is a story of a man who radically cuts himself off from community, and this is a man where a community keeps thrusting itself yeah. upon him yeah. until he finally gets this little entourage yeah. tr- tr- trucking through the wasteland yeah. with him. And I think that's part of the charm of the story. And, yeah, uh, he even even the has one scene later on, or at some point in the movie, where even the dog comes up there, and he says, the dog, and he says, well, the dog might as well come along, everyone else is. And uh, <laughs> finally, the, the, the truck, and it's got all these odd people, plus the dog, and none of them are the kind of people he'd normally run with. They're certainly not <laughs> other, other uh, men of war who could uh, be of some benefit to him along the way as far as a protective aspect so there he is sort of the one warrior with with this whole group and it uh and that then so he's finally he's finally forced he's finally then gets rejuvenated he finally gets feelings again after many years the um the character of chief dan george is is a particularly mm-hmm. funny and and good character in mm-hmm. this and i think you had I think you mentioned to me one time that you had a lot of, a lot of fun working with him as oh, yeah. a director, and uh, that it was a kind of, I don't know, kind of special relationship. Yeah, he he was a classic guy. He was uh, the first time I, I had seen him in in a couple of films, and he uh, he was just kind of a natural one of these guys that has a face that you you, you knew the face would work for you. The delivery, uh, he was quite an elderly man, and he wasn't a professional actor uh, by profession for many years so he didn't have any great technique to his he just had a a great charisma in fact the first time i saw him he came in in an all white suit white tie white shirt white coat and and he looked like some he looked like some indian god or something he's kind of <laughs> and he had this great big swedish gal who was a little bit taller than he was with him and she was his nurse <laughs> and she was his nurse and at least that that was the way it was presented to me and <laughs> I believed it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, we were down in, in uh, Lake Powell, Arizona, and he would, uh, he, they'd go out dancing every night. He was out dancing and doing this. I thought, what a wonderful. Here's a man who's 80 or whatever he was in the late 70s or early 80s, and he was enjoying himself. He was enjoying himself going out dancing and partying and having a good time. Uh, a couple times it showed on him the next day, but not too bad. He, <laughs> he, he always seemed to have the same look. Uh, the first scene I did with him, the first scene I did with him, he couldn't, he couldn't remember any of his lines. And I, and they thought, well, should we make boards so he can read them? And I said, no, you can't do that. He's just gotta, to, uh, 
uh, he's just got to remember them. So I, I just had a guy rehearse them with the lines and rehearse the lines over and over and over. And then finally I'd say to him, just before we were ready to shoot, as the camera's rolling, I'd say to that chief, just forget all about all those lines. Just forget all that dialogue and everything you've been rehearsing. And just, just sit here for a minute. And so we'd sit there and the camera would roll for a second. And I'd say, now tell me that story, you know, about the Indian who came over the hill and the, and, and the, it was some point to the scene. And he'd just start talking and go, well, yes. And then the lion. And it was just wonderful. And pretty soon I found myself mesmerized by this story. And I'd <laughs> photograph it and I'd cover around a couple of points and, and, uh, and go off with them. And then other times later on in the, in the picture, he kind of got, he kind of got used to working with me. And then he, uh, sometimes he'd just, pile in there and have every line everything just perfect there's one wonderful moment towards the end where he comes in, into Josie Wales as Josie's going to leave and he's going to leave the family and uh, go back and and uh, take the pursued d- divert the pursued pursuing group away from from the danger there and uh, and he comes out and he has this little scene in the barn with him and it was just terrific he, um, very emotional mm-hmm. as I was in it it was very emotional I thought God how am I going to keep maintaining my composure with that guy's going to tug at me like this? <laughs> well, just one of the things about your work as a director is that almost like John Ford, it seems to me you have a little snock company. There are actors who come back and back in your pictures. Not absolutely every one of them, but they've done three and four pictures for you. And first of all, I like that, uh, but there's some... Again, it's sort of like Ford. It, it it orients you in the film, no matter what the subject matter of the film is. But what is you, what's what's the reasoning with that? Uh, you know, the Jeff Lewis's and the uh, these people whom I, I right. like and I think very often do their best work for you. Mm-hmm. Well, Bill McKinney, uh, yep. who was in this film, as well as some of the others, and a lot of them along the way, it's very comforting uh, for a director to start a film. And you got a big project and a lot of people around. It's very comforting to have a familiar face come mm-hmm. popping in. A guy like Jeff Lewis, who's an extremely mobile actor, extremely uh, uh, mobile face. He can play many things. He comes along, you know he's going to deliver. You know, you know exactly what the problems are going to be or not going to be with him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's, that's a comfortable factor. I, I do that occasionally. I did that especially during that era. I did three or four pictures with almost the same stock group. Uh, lately, I haven't done it just because it hasn't called for it, but I I still uh, would love to work with uh, any of those people any time in the future. Is that is that partly because you are acting, that, that, that in a certain sense this is a group of people you can count on so you don't have to directorially worry about uh, them I think too? subconsciously that's it, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that... Even now, we have you know some kind of a sense of a range of of work developing here, uh, and I think the next clip selection um, you know really emphasizes that point. And uh, coincidentally, again, it's it's more or less in order of, of making. Uh, seen from I think among the Eastwood fans is one of. A, a kind of universal favorite amongst your movies, and that's that's Bronco Billy. Um, and uh, again, I think this scene is very close to being uh, self-evident what's going on in it. I think the only thing you have to know if you can't, ah, you can tell. Bronco Billy is is not such a hot uh, rodeo uh, and western figure, and. Uh, uh, he may know it some of, some of the time, but then again, some of the time I'm not sure he does. <laughs> and um, this is a little, not a scene, but rather a sequence um, in which uh, uh, Billy, who is, among other things, uh, absolute, kind of a crook and kind of a four-square American all at the same time, or maybe that's not so contradictory after all, but anyway... Uh, <laughs> That's this scene. <laughs> so wonderful. I love the heroic way you shot Bronco Billy. The, the climaxing with the flag. <laughs> He's such a ham. Actually, uh, Bronco Billy, uh, the idea of doing this story uh, was very appealing. 
it was a it was submitted to me by an unlikely way somebody submitted it, and I thought it was about a story about Bronco Billy Anderson, who was a, a famous uh, silent movie uh, cowboy. And then I, I started reading. I couldn't put it down. I thought, this is the most outrageous story I have ever seen in my life, and I guess I'm just crazy enough to do it. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I went ahead and made it. I made it. I was making the film or preparing to go into a film called Escape from Alcatraz, and so I did this one right afterwards. But it's... Uh, it was a, a fascinating uh, departure, and it was a, a fascinating guy, and the whole American dream, and an obsolete show that has no longer got any value, um, an obsolete, obsolete mentality, it seems like, in our lifetime. But here's a dreamer who's going to just continue on. He has this concern for kids and all this sort of thing, but he's, he's living in another era, and he's, so he's not really too swift. <laughs> but uh, he has his little group, and and hopefully fate will uh, fate brings him a rich woman finally. <laughs> did you uh, did you people often refer to this as a Capra esque movie? Did you, did you think of it in that way? Yeah, I, I when I read it, I the first thought came to my mind. I said, if Frank Capra was still directing films, this would be a film that he might do. Mm-hmm. They certainly weren't doing anything like that at, uh, in the 70s and, uh, and in the 80s. I have seen that, that kind of project. So that, therefore, it was a little bit against the grain, but I, uh, I just felt, f for me, I had to do it. Did you feel like it was kind of maybe time to kind of bust your kind of taciturn, heroic image? It was time for that kind of a change of pace? I think so. Uh, we 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 tried to bust it with a little bit in Play Misty, but uh, in this one, it um, this in a different way. It uh, kind of takes off. It's a little bit of a takeoff on uh, as a modern day cowboy of some some of the uh, type of things I had done, and it was um, it was fascinating to play. Very very great fun too. Great, I must say, it was great fun. All the characters were. were is there crazy. A is there a difference in directing comedy? I mean, from your point of view, I mean, what's, the, what's the substantial difference between doing that, let's say, and um, let's take something of wrong the same scale, something like, um, um, say, the Dirty Harry picture, or, uh, you know, I mean, what's, what's the difference from a director's point of view in approaching that or, or dealing with it? There is a, a difference in, in, in directing it, but I must say that I couldn't... Uh, draw it out for you in an analytical way it just it's just kind of an instinct you have the story sort of dictates a certain kind of life of its own mm -hmm. a certain look a certain composition and that that just sort of comes about by forging ahead into it i don't uh, with a dirty harry right away you'd think of the different different terms of heroics uh, different terms of uh, of uh, the the heroics in this are all sort of they're all false and they're all they're all uh, comical, but if you you still play it seriously, I mean, I played Bronco yeah. Billy. Everybody's serious as I played uh, any other oh, sure. any other role. I just, uh, in fact, the, the more serious you play it, the more outrageous it becomes. But it, just looking in this little clip, and I think it's true elsewhere in the film, uh, your angles and the way you're shooting it are, in fact, parodies of Western cliches, yeah. uh, which sort yeah. of reinforce. Uh, this notion that, in fact, he's not an authentic Westerner, as I was a shoe yeah. clerk from somewhere or other. So whatever he knows about the West, he probably learned from the movies. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and he, he admits that the only thing, the only way he, he learned from the West is by uh, spending his spare nickel on a film in the uh, in his early days. But this um, and and the idea of doing a scene where you're sticking up a bunch of little kids and they all raise their hands and they turn around, it's an outrageous kind of scene. Most people. I mean, it, it would be, you, if you approached anything like that cautiously, you could be in real trouble. You have to really forge in there mm -hmm. and go for it. <laughs> and as later on, there's a sequence in this film where they rob a train even. And it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. I mean, you're robbing a streamlined train that's roaring across there <laughs> with the 47 Chevy or whatever it was, 50, what is it, what was that car? Does anybody know? That one? It's a 57 Chevy or whatever it was, and uh, and a bunch of people with uh, bows and arrows, and and it's it was a ridiculous scene too. But you have to kind of go for it. He even has dialogue in the film where he says, "Yeah," when he tells the girl, "Yeah, I was just nothing but a shoe salesman in, in, in New Jersey, and then one day I laid down my shoehorn, 
and then, <laughs> and then, and then went off and, and pursued the American dream, his dream. <laughs> but you can't play uh, something like that. You could say, oh, you can't say that. I mean, you can't say that. And you could take a line like that out. But think of what, what, what the play would have missed if you had taken something like that out. It's, uh, it's just, it would have taken the, uh, you would eventually strip the color away from the uh, whole project. I think uh, it's one of the things we haven't even mentioned here, but uh, a lot of your films, I mean, I, I just thought of a little line there of, of, of the Chiefs in the previous clip, uh, you know, hell's going to come for breakfast. It's a wonderful line. Uh, uh, it's a beautiful piece of writing, and I think the writing here is, and uh, I think sometimes we get caught up so in the action of one of your films that uh, we often don't notice sort of the care of the writing. And I think all throughout Bronco Billy, the, the language of Billy is is wonderfully done. But I don't even know who wrote this picture, but it's it's a well written picture in the same way that yeah. uh, the kind of authentic pioneer dialogue of, uh, uh, of Josie is, is rings has a nice authentic ring to it yeah yeah i don't uh, I, I just think that comes from good writing this was written by dennis hacken who was a fellow i didn't know before uh, but i didn't change i changed very little in this script it was a script that just worked from beginning to end i have an impression and, you and don't change scripts that much it, not if they're good there. i don't believe in tampering with something that if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of mentality and that's uh um i also have the impression that unlike a lot of people today, you really don't go out there very often with a script that's dissatisfying to you. Uh, not often. I would try not to. <laughs> I don't think, I think at this time in my career it would be very uh, uh, silly to do that. Uh, and, and directing and acting, doing the whole project is a, is a difficult job. You don't have to uh, sit up at night and kind of sweat the dialogue. It's much more comforting to know that that the dialogue is well written in there. You, you like it when you first started, you're going to go for it. Well, in the age of the auteur, uh, it is becoming kind of legendary how guys go out there, at least by their own to telling of the story, do a great deal of changing on the set, uh, are emboldened because they, after all, are the author of the film, to head out for very remote locations without a finished script and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, obviously, that does not something that appeals either to your prudent or your frugal soul. I think that, uh, I think that, um, that you, the, the, the true creative process is a writing. And if you've got a, a good writer, don't, don't try to deny it. Being an auteur is, means that you're directing the film, but you, you're not denying good material. Um, if it's good, don't don't tamper with it. If it's bad, tamper. I've tampered with lots of scripts, and I've done a lot of rewriting, but usually I've done it prior to starting the script, and I was very satisfied with the way it was all together. But in this particular project, there was very little. I think I added one scene. There's one sequence in the film where he goes into a bank, and some guy is robbing, robbing the bank, and, and these guys come in and rob the bank, and this little kid, and, and Billy's not doing anything. He's just standing there. And he doesn't do anything until they knock some little kid down and break his piggy bank. And then <laughs> Rocco Billy draws his guns and shoots. And he has these little, uh, he has these little buckshot kind of shots that he uses for his act. And so that, that wounds these guys and he subdues them. And then he becomes very, then I took a scene from Muhammad Ali. Um, he, outside he has a scene where there's a news conference and they're asking him various things about how he foiled the bank robbery. And I was always fascinated uh, uh, when Muhammad Ali would win a fight. They'd ask him questions about uh, uh, how he won it and how was the left hook here and the right cross. And he'd always be combing his hair and say, I want to talk to Muhammad so-and-so. I want to talk about my mother and so-and-so. And, -so. and he never was listening to anybody. He was just projecting everything he wanted to transmit over television in one big <laughs> deal. And so I had Billy do the same thing. Here was his great moment on television. He wasn't going to let anybody know that the Bronx, uh, not know that the Bronco Billy Wild West show was playing outside of town. <laughs> so those are the only two scenes that I added to the picture. Everything else was there as Dennis uh, had written. Um, we're actually jumping ahead almost a, a decade uh, to the next clip. Uh, 
to a movie that I have enormous regard for. Uh, it's Bird. Um, it's, uh, I think, does represent an enormous change in Clint's, um, not in his essential self, but in, uh, uh, in, if you will, that awful word, in his development. I think there's a, a big, uh, a big step forward in terms of technique, ambition, and, uh, accomplishment in this movie. Um, the, uh, scene or scenes it's a sequence that we're going to see and it's quite long um begins with um bird uh and uh dizzy gillespie and uh bird is in bad shape dizzy dizzy is in good shape bird would like to be in that kind of condition i think the scene metaphorically goes at an enormous number of issues of uh, uh of creativity uh, and how to deal with it. I think it, it also goes at aspects of masculinity, if you will. Um, the scene leads into uh, a truly tragic uh, sequence uh, um, that also needs no explanation. But uh, this to locate it, this is somewhere halfway along in, in, in the film and in the career of Charlie Parker. Uh, he has achieved something uh, through his art and uh, is about to lose or in the process of losing uh, really if you will his uh, his self and his soul uh, so bird it's hard to um, pose a simple question after something like that I did have the feeling on well, several times I've seen this movie that in some way to ease into this topic a little, uh, the, the Dizzy Gillespie speaks kind of for Clint Eastwood in a way, for the, that side of you that uh, believes in discipline, professionalism, uh, doing your job, uh, that sort of thing. Is that, is that true? Was it, were you drawn to that character in that way? Um, I think so, yeah. It wasn't to, to make this film and to make a film about the tragedy of a drug uh, addict and someone who had completely abused himself. Uh, somebody who takes his genius away from uh, uh, us as an audience as fast as he as he came on the scene and gave it to us is uh, is um, it wasn't necessarily to pay tribute to uh, uh, to every fallen genius. It was to it's actually in a, in a way a left handed way of paying tribute to all the great geniuses, the Ellingtons, the Dizzy Gillespies, the Count Basies, the Fats Wallers, the people over the years who did did run did live normal lives and did have a uh, a normal existence. Uh, they were equally as brilliant as um, as Charlie Parker. Dizzy Gillespie certainly had a lot to do with the Bob Revolution, the same way as as Bird did. But uh, he chose another way. He ch I'm sure he had his moments in in life of being out on the road. And, but I I know him fairly well, and I I uh, talk to him. He's in his seventies now, his early seventies, and he. Um, He's still out there playing. He's still enjoying himself, having a great time. And uh, he just wasn't as tormented. And why one man is tormented and the other isn't, uh, it's very hard to say. Uh, Charlie Parker is another case, uh, much like uh, in, in White Hunter. Uh, is you, you, like the, you like him even though here he is in a scene where he's, uh, he's out with another woman. He's uh, when his, I guess the news of his... Uh, daughter's death and uh and he's uh, they're doing all these crazy things he's refused to come back he's refused to to uh, live up to his responsibilities to be there on time to really hit the marks and go and yet uh yet you feel for him you still feel for him you don't get the feeling of saying oh it serves you right you bum and uh, when i first read those telegrams those are the actual telegrams that were that were uh, sent at that time just reading him in sequence, you can just see the whole story unfolding. You can see the man just collapsing, mentally just uh, d disintegrating, right? Almost in that period of, of an hour or two, they all came, they all were mailed the same night. So uh, it, uh, m my biggest challenge was to try to, to get that feeling of what it must have been like for him, the inner turmoil, and then finally reverting back to drugs as his crutch. All the things that Dizzy 
might not have done or that Duke Ellington might not have done or, uh, or other major, major players long life. There, there have been other tragic cases, Big Spiderbeck and other brilliant people who have, uh, who have followed the, the route that uh, eventually Ch uh, Bird did. But uh, that's not to pay tribute to that. It's just to say that it was there and uh, they, were, they, were, they were brilliant people on the American scene. And uh, let's explore what made him tick and try to try to figure out what was it that what was it that made him. Uh, was that the challenge inherent in this film to keep this person likable in the sense that uh, what's striking when you see the film overall is its sort of marvelous lack of obvious sentiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is to say, he is not played as a great tragic genius mm -hmm. he is shown but he is not played in that way and in some way i think that's one of the most remarkable achievements of bird um that unlike most biopics uh which take the you know the the obvious way out in telling the life of a tragic or self-destructive genius which is to kind of sentimentalize it and it seems to me that you have avoided that in, that in that way but i'm wondering you know how did you avoid it? Was that an issue with you as you proceeded or, or as you looked at this possible this picture? I think it's an issue. It's an issue of people standing up for their responsibility and, and taking care of themselves. They have to, uh, you can, uh, we see, we see it commonly today. We see people taking the, the defense in court, uh, the defense of saying, well, uh, my mother beat me when I was five years old and I, I got a bad deal and that's why I went out and murdered 27 people. And so uh, I, I really only deserve six months in probation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of, uh, uh, but but we tried to stay away from that kind of crybaby thing. Of mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Bird never was a guy who apologized in his life, and, and I don't, at least I don't think so. And from talking to people who knew him rather closely, he just sort of went this way, and he he did not advocate. He threatened to beat the hell out of Jerry Mulligan once when, when he even contemplated using drugs. And he, uh, he threatened to beat the hell out of Red Rodney as, as depicted in the film. When he even, uh, when he went out and got, got stoned, he just, he didn't like it. It was for, for him, but not for anyone else. And it was just an odd paradoxical person. He wasn't a person that felt sorry for himself. So therefore it was very easy not to get manipulative. Do the obvious uh, soap opera manipulation. He, he could go back and say, "Well, in Kansas City, in my early days, everything happened, and this and that, and and I was a product of my environment." For every person that's a product of environment like that, there's another guy like Dizzy who came from the same environment, who's who is was equally as brilliant, who who did something else with it. He took it somewhere and made a, a wonderful life for himself. So that's just showing that difference, but to get man manipulative and self and wallow in, in pity as a, as a movie maker would have been a, a, not a good tribute to the man, I don't think. So uh, you were in a certain sense trying to keep the genius, which I know you admire from in music, uh, in a certain sense separate from this other thing. In other words, the behavior is not the genius doesn't stem from the behavior, which is, I think, a common mistake made by people when they mm -hmm. deal with colorful, artistic lives. You say, well, without that, he couldn't have been what he was. I think you're making almost the opposite point. I think the, the opposite point. And I, and uh, I feel indirectly he was responsible, uh, even though he was, a, he was an anti-drug, he, he, he made anti-drug statements to friends and people who would listen, but he would not... Uh, he indirectly started a lot of people using drugs because at that particular time in history, everybody revered him. And he was so far ahead of his time musically. And everyone thought, well, that's the way you, you got to follow Bird's uh, life because that's the way you became uh, really good. And that's the way Red Rodney got involved with it. He, he told me that. And even though Bird threatened to kill him if he got involved with it, he uh, became, became involved because they thought they could play better. In reality, if you... Red now goes around the country and and speaks to uh, to drug groups and to rehabilitation groups, and he he's playing better than ever right now, and he doesn't uh, he doesn't get involved with anything. I mean, he's Mister uh, he's Mister Health Kick. He's mm -hmm. gone a complete metamorphosis. The um, do you feel in any sense that uh, as 
come up in the last two or three weeks uh, that you are not entitled to make uh, a film about black life and black musicians. I mean, in other words, Spike Lee has been uh, on the hustings in recent recent days sort of saying, you know, my picture is more authentic than his picture. <laughs> I think, uh, I, obviously, I, I haven't seen Mr. Lee's picture, and, and, I, and, and I hope it's terrific. And, uh, and I think I'd love to see 20 jazz pictures because I love the art form uh, uh, made. Uh, but I don't think he has that much confidence in his picture. Otherwise, he wouldn't be referring to other pictures in, in comparison. That's taking a sort of a defensive attitude. <laughs> um, had you imagined always that at some point in your life you would take up the other subject that you care about greatly, which is jazz in a, in a movie? Had this been something you've been angling for, trying for, looking for properties to do? I uh, hadn't been looking for it consciously, but I knew that the Charlie Parker project was at Columbia. I snuck a read at it. I liked it. I knew it was there, but it, and I, I knew for quite a few years it was there. And then one day, I just happened to be sitting in an office at Warner Brothers, and, and somebody came in and said that Columbia wanted a property that Warner's own called Revenge, and Warner's didn't want to make it. And they said, well, sell it to them. And I said, wait a minute, just before you make any quick decisions here, they have a property that I really love, this thing called the Charlie Parker story. They'd been fooling around with, they'd talked about Richard Pryor, they'd talked about all kinds of the usual kind of commercial casting uh, thing, that the, the, like they would have made the film many years ago, uh, sort of a studio mentality kind of thing. They, and so uh, I got it, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want any, anybody who's recognizable. I want to just make it as a semi-biographical. At least there's one segment of his life. But um, it was... Uh, it was a great challenge, and uh, I, I love jazz. I, I grew up with it. I saw Charlie Parker. He was the singular most confident individual I've ever seen in my life when he was playing the saxophone. When he wasn't, he was just drift into the woodwork. But and they'd stand in those days. They stood on the stage, and, and they all wore suits and ties, and all the musicians did. And they sat, and uh, and he came out and he started playing. And when, once he started playing, the whole room was overwhelmed. Even if you didn't understand what he's doing, and most people didn't, uh, at least in the beginning, uh, you 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 couldn't believe that anyone was that such a wizard. And also, uh, and it doesn't really show even in this film because all those all those tracks were done in mono, and that we don't really have stereophonic like it was presented. It was there was just none of those recordings were made in those days. But what we do have is uh, the best we could come up with was taking his tracks and and revitalizing them by trying to get the players back and, and spreading the tracks out and making stereophonic out of it. But he was a, a, a fascinating character, and I thought, well, this is a, some American history and movie history should know something about this man. What about, um, stylistically, this seems to me a movie quite different from your other movies. Uh, it's um, darker and richer in a certain kind of imagery, uh, I think of you as, as you know, as really primarily a, a director of great straightforwardness and great, you know, narrative push forward. And uh, this this film has, uh, I don't know, a, a more not only a more noirish look, but a more noirish camera, if you will. I mean, in terms of of mood, wardrobe, the costuming for this picture, like it was in black and white, like in grays and browns and so and tones. Uh, much like you got the feeling from the black and white pictures of the f 40s. Um, it um, Style, I, like I said earlier, I think every picture has its own style. With me, everyone take, it takes it over and it, take, it, it becomes a, an entity by itself. I don't have any r real style. I just, uh, the style of that particular project, it's, a, it's an individual thing. I think they all look different as you see the clips on Bronco Billy and then Josie mm -hmm. Wales, there's quite a difference. But uh, that's, uh, that's just the way it comes out. I, don't, I can't tell you why that happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to go to a picture that does have a different style uh, than this, I think. Um, it's the current uh, picture. Uh, we have two clips because I think it's necessary to have uh, two clips from this 
film because, of course, most of you probably have not seen it um, because it's not in the theaters yet. Um, as we all know, John Wilson, played by Clint in this picture, is a portrait originally written by uh, Peter Viertel in a novel called uh, Black Hunter, White, White Hunter, Black Heart. It's a, uh, uh, a, scene, a story of a man, John Huston, who's a man of both charm and cruelty. Um, a man, I think, uh, much taken with certain kinds of macho values, if you will, uh, who um, offers in the differing as different parts of the movie, um, you know, both the good side and the bad side of that particular set of sort of traditional male values. Uh, in the first scene we're going to see, we're going to see, you know, uh, Houston, Wilson, uh, at his most charming and charmingly devilish, if you will. Uh, they're on location. They're uh, in darkest Africa. Uh, a movie company is coming to the place where they will be living and shooting a film of rather like the African Queen. And this is uh, the director's welcome uh, to their encampment and to the beginning of their movie-making adventure. Is there something... Similar between those two artists in terms of distraction by obsession and uh, uh, self destructiveness and so forth. I mean, well, I guess uh, I guess so. Uh, not in the same way. Uh, uh, you, you're referring to Bird, Bird and, to, uh, yeah. and to John Wilson. Uh, I think John Wilson is subtly. Uh, uh, self-destructive in the sense that he kind of chain smokes and doesn't take care of himself and and uh, he's constantly he's constantly drinking too much and living a rather wild life and traveling about the about the planet but at the same token uh, and but his obsession I'm not sure his diversion his his diversion of uh, of uh, the of being obsessed with elephants in the uh, in Africa and hunting of elephants rather than getting to the the job of making the film is kind of is kind of a, I feel maybe almost like it's a defense it's if you don't pay attention too much then you don't have the anxieties of really attacking the job and every job every film you start is probably uh has a certain amount of anxieties with it having to answer having to res to to face responsibility and so in, in directly not re facing responsibility he sort of uh and sort of laughing at the face of responsibility, he sort of becomes uh, somewhat insulated. He sort of protects himself. In this scene, though, it gives an example of Wilson, uh, the cruel side of him, the fact that he can get everybody laughing and have a good time, but it's always at the expense of somebody, the expense of somebody who's trying hard to do a job. The, uh, in the case of the real, uh, the real incident with the African Queen in 1951, they did have this problem, and he and Sam Spiegel, who had worked before very closely in other films and, and worked well, all of a sudden didn't get along on this one because John was going off and and acting rather strange. But uh, the same thing with John Wilson in this particular project, he goes off, and uh, and Sam Spiegel, who is uh, is is trying to, or Paul Landers as we play it. Is trying desperately to get the film going, and there's every every other reason is being put up to uh, to not face the job. Well, I mean that is the same, isn't it? I mean, in a certain sense, it's people not facing up mm -hmm. to. Uh, could we go so far as to say we've discovered the the great Eastwoodian theme here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, Dizzy said that in the other one. I, yeah. I face up. I, That's when right. I and, and I think it's implicit yeah. in, in, in a lot of, I mean, um, the dreamer, even Bronco Billy, at some point in life has to face up to who he really is, mm -hmm. what he is, to give up these kind of, this well, kind of craziness that he's involved in. Well, the craziness, in. though, Bronco Billy did face up to it. He faced mm -hmm. up to it earnestly, and he was there in time to do the job, <laughs> yeah. even though the job was there'd be two or three people in the audience, and nobody cared anymore about Wild West shows and what have you. But his dream was he believed in responsibility, and mm -hmm. he believed in all of those things in a much more maybe naive way than I well, do. Well, I don't want to press the point, <laughs> but it does seem to me that, you know, 
what we what we see in a lot of your movies are men attempting to uh, involved with the issue of the job, either evading it or, in the case of Dirty Harry, maybe doing it too well. (laughs) But somehow work as a metaphor is not a common one in American movies today. I mean, we're often, you know, ditzying around after much more glamorous, curious, exotic subjects than that. And yet work and the job is something that does come up uh, a great deal in your movies, it seems to yeah, me. Yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, another movie I, I did shortly after this one uh, uh, was called Hoggy Talk Man, and that was mm-hmm. about uh, a man who was afraid to succeed. Mm-hmm. Here was a guy who had a chance, had an opportunity, and the more he got closer to that, that chance, to that opportunity, mm-hmm. which was his audition, the more uh, self-destruct he got and the point where he, he didn't want to ever face. Mm-hmm. He was afraid of, of winning. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether that's a, a kind of like um, I, I don't think I can't think of an analogy in modern day history other than maybe Richard Nixon, who was, who was a man who had had a, a respectable first term and, and insisted on destroying it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that and that was that's a, a curiosity will, will never be answered. Nobody will ever be able to answer that that reason. And nobody will ever answer the guy in Honky Tonk Man either. It was just a man who was afraid to succeed. And he, he hid behind booze and he hid behind every other excuse not to go there. I guess maybe it, maybe indirectly you're right. Maybe it is a, something, a statement on the work ethic. or Well, it seems to me that kind of guys of our age, maybe the last generation, where work was a significant issue, whether you got it or didn't get it, whether you... You know, made a living or didn't make a living. I mean, I, I think, think we're most, the last. Most the last thirty-five-year-olds of... feel that way. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like us. <laughs> <laughs> we began the first clip of this uh, evening now with a, a clip of a man extremely proficient with a gun and uh, using it with a certain. Uh, joy, if, if you will. Uh, we end the evening with uh, the concluding piece from White Hunter, uh, in which John Wilson finally does achieve his dream, which is a confrontation uh, with an elephant, uh, with results uh, at the very least ironic and uh, at uh, the most tragic. Um, I think it's an extraordinarily powerful sequence. I think it shows, again, some of Quint's virtues as a director of an action sequence that is yet carrying uh, a very heavy emotional uh, weight and as well a a potent irony. Um, I think um, it's a wonderful place to, uh, to... and at least the pictorial portion of, of, of this program. Uh, the conclusion of his most recent film, a film I have uh, enormous respect for, and uh, one that I, I think uh, will, like m- most of the films, that all of the films that we have looked at samples of tonight, will be films that, uh, you know, whatever they're, their status uh, in terms of awards, uh, critical comment, or whatnot, will be films uh, that in years to come, uh, 20 and 30 years from now, will be the films like the films of, say, the 30s and the 40s that were also not Academy Award winners and so forth, but are the films that uh, we have affection for and continue to lay claims on us, claims on us uh, emotionally uh, as well as intellectually and uh, most of all affectionately. Uh, At any rate, uh, this is a film, a kind of sobering note to end on this this clip from uh, White Hunter Blackheart, but uh, we'll try and take you off with a laugh afterwards. (laughs) Was that a scary sequence to shoot? Well, any time you're dealing with an animal that weighs in the thousands of pounds, uh, you have to hope that he's going to stop when he's supposed to stop. 
and it was very difficult to shoot. Uh, I, I had to, naturally you make all camera moves are all uh, conditioned around him. Um, but uh, it, it was it was fun. To, it went uh, quite a bit easier than uh, I expected. But it is dangerous. There have been people uh, killed uh, doing this kind of uh, work when you're working around elephants. Some, something that big, if you just don't pay attention, you can. I paid attention. Believe me, <laughs> there was a lot of respect given this uh, guy, uh, and and that was the domesticated one out with the wild ones. And that you saw the, the larger herds there were all wild. Elephants, and though they sort of meander sometimes, they can move relatively fast, and they 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 have just horrendous strength. So you uh, you give them you give them a lot of leeway. But I had to get the sequence. And we we actually had a, a a guy, one of the natives who doubled a kivu there. We actually got him in the laying across the uh, the the tusks and 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 lifting him up in the air and everything. The elephant actually lifted him up. Oh my God. So we were uh, that uh, that was kind of tricky, but the fella had done it and practiced it a few times, and so <laughs> I, had, I wasn't about to put Kibo there, though he was a, a former tracker, had been a tracker uh, most of his younger life, and uh, so he he did know a lot about it. But um, in this film, it seems to me taken again together with Bird. Uh, that what we're coming to in your work is is studies of extremely complex characters, characters of more complexity, it seems to me, than we are used to seeing in American movies at this particular time. And that, you know, well, this, as we see, you know, the, the, the action-adventure motif is, is very present in this picture. The complexity of, of just the two, even visible in these two sequences, and that doesn't begin to... Uh, talk about the richness of of the Wilson character and the uh, uh, the playfulness and the charm and the evil and the principledness and the unprincipledness of him and the and the kind of crazy sort of Hemingway esque literary ideas that I think move him. All of this stuff. It seems to me you are coming to wish to do in these films deal with human complexity in a way that's that's really quite remarkable and may account for the fact that. Uh, in Europe, these movies are, are sometimes critically more warmly received, I think, than they are uh, sometimes in the United States. Uh, is that something you feel you're pushing toward? Um, I, I've had a, a, I just like the individual stories, the European uh, thing you touched on. Uh, I think Europeans uh, uh, revere jazz. They revere a lot of American art forms. It is... It is very fashionable for Americans sometimes to appreciate something that comes from somewhere else, and maybe uh, maybe we can look at things uh, that come from somewhere else more objectively than something that is uh, that is, we've grown up with or we've seen a lot of. Uh, I know Europeans have been asking me, especially the French, uh, back in, since back in the seventies, when is America going to start making films for adults again? And uh, I I say. Uh, I don't, I don't know, but uh, there are films for adults, but sometimes they don't uh, respond well. And the big question is, uh, uh, what is the chicken or the egg syndrome? What, uh, what uh, comes first? Are adults not going to movies because they just don't go to movies, or are they go not going to movies because there's nothing out there that is challenging or thoughtful enough for them to, to bother with? If, and... Uh, that's a big question. We, we don't know that. There are some indications every once in a while an adult subject a film comes along that does extremely well, and that's encouraging. But uh, for every one like that, there are some very fine films that don't get any response. And uh, we don't know whether that's uh, they just ne that was never intended to be or whether they were sold incorrectly or, or, or a combination of, of both. Um, but... Who knows? Uh, I, I, the, I, I don't think I can really come to... A, uh, I wasn't so much thinking about that, but I was thinking about your own self, that you seem to be drawing yourself to, as I say, um, films that uh, will pause over quirks of character, over contradictions of character, uh, in a way that in these last two films in particular seems to be just remarkable in that... Um, we aren't seeing that kind of characterological examination 
in movies, whether they're commercially mm-hmm. successful or not, isn't mm-hmm. important. I'm I'm really kind of asking you. Yeah. It seems to be something that it's coming yeah. out of something, some need of yours or some desire of yours. Uh, well, I think it's a desire of mine, and maybe it's a need. I don't I don't know. Maybe it dates back to the earlier question, your statement you were making in in regards to branching out, or whether it's a it's something I've just always wanted to. I've always enjoyed myself. I think most everything is related to what you enjoy watching. And I've always enjoyed pictures in the past, and things that that, that examine uh, various quirks of personality. Uh, nothing's worse than just having a straight character that's just straight character. You have to have good sides to them, bad sides. If there isn't weaknesses, uh, then there then there's then the strengths aren't accentuated. And so, uh, uh, to make a well-rounded character, a believable character, unless you're just going for straight fantasy, you have to have these things and. Uh, and at this point in my life, it's uh, it's it's fun to reach out for them. Uh, I've I've done characters where the the fantasy character he arrives, he walks in, he walks out, and he affects things and leaves. But that uh, that would be very very unsatisfying to spend the the rest of your life doing that sort of thing. It Is seems it? Uh, it seems that the, the these little quirks are, are are the are the fun parts of them. I've always tried to add a weakness to even the strongest characters I've mm-hmm. played. I've tried to add some. Chinks in the armor that that cause him uh, that cause him to uh, to have second thoughts or maybe the thoughts of why am I doing this? And then Josie Wales in the Western is a great example. Is this something that because you're an actor it is an influence on you in a director that may as a director that wouldn't be true of another fellow who was, hadn't been an actor? Do you think it's something in the actor's temperament that looks for this kind of thing in a way that it the purely directorial temperament does not? Maybe, maybe so. And maybe it's the challenge of the acting itself uh, to play the character. The director, the, and to direct only, the only disadvantage of that is you don't get to really have the enjoyment sometime of rounding the character. You may have the enjoyment of participating and encouraging the actor, but you don't really get the chance to really get up and... and uh, and fire, you know, fire the <laughs> at the target, and uh, and the actor does get to do that. So the actor, in in a, in a reaching out vein, wants to wants to increase the size of his capability within le- legitimate casting. That's within you don't cast the ridiculousness. Uh, you, you can't. You have to stay within. Unless you're doing a very satirical film, you have to stay within uh, in reason. Uh, Michael J. Fox playing. Uh, but he's playing Clint is it's quite the, funny, <laughs> actually. His, his, uh, his, he's, his amusing, and, and he's doing some of the antics mm-hmm. that um, are parodying some of the antics that I did in the film, and it, it works uh, as a as a humorous vein. But you wouldn't want to do. I mean, Clint Eastwood shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Somebody else should do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, the fact of the matter is that, that we know each other, and in fact, I have directed Clint Eastwood in my life, very warily, um, <laughs> uh, for a television film that I wrote, produced, and directed with, with my wife. Uh, it's unlikely that we would be uh, as friendly as we are uh, if I didn't have uh, respect for what he does. Uh, I think we met some 13 or 14 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't view his work objectively. But I don't really, as a critic, view almost anybody's work objectively. There is no such thing, you know. I mean, you bring all your prejudices, both for and against artists, to the act of criticism. And I think insofar as you make clear that those are your, your prejudices, uh, that's about all you can do as a critic. There is no such thing really as objectivity. Um, the uh, the friendship has just happened, kind of, and uh, uh, I enjoy it. I don't know what he thinks about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I can uh, I can dig out quite a few notices uh, done by Richard in past years that weren't quite as enthusiastic as some of them. <laughs> As some of the comments on some of the films you've seen tonight, so uh, I think he, he, he can't be objective. If he doesn't like something, uh, believe me, uh, 
you'll know about it, and sometimes unhappily so. <laughs> but uh, we do, as critics, I think, and it's part of our jobs, uh, try to um, encourage that which we believe in. I believe in vernacular American filmmaking. I believe in people who do their jobs conscientiously and unpretentiously in the way that Clint does. I believe that this is the main line of American filmmaking. So uh, I'm pleased to appear in public with him, and I'm, I'm pleased to appear in private with him. Thank you very much tonight.